So next, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce, introduce Gabby Drummond. Gabby is, a, Gabby is a graduate student in the Brain and Cognitive Science Department, um, and she's conducting her thesis research with Professor Moganka Sir. Today, her talk is entitled The Role of Norepinephrine on Brain Function During Learning. Hi everyone, as Brovi said, my name is Gabby and I'm a grad student in Merganka's lab here at the PCAR Institute. And we're interested in how the neuromodulator, norepinephrine, mediates goal-directed behaviors and learning, uh, and how this goes awry in uh, disorders where there's abnormal norepinephrine signaling. And so norepinephrine, also known as noradrenaline, is most commonly known for its role in mediating our fight or flight response or stress responses. Um, and in this case, norepinephrine is acting on the periphery uh, to kind of constrict our blood vessels, increase our heart rate, et cetera, and prime our body to respond to stressors in the environment. But norepinephrine, which I'll be referring to as NE throughout the talk, um, also acts on the brain to regulate arousal and attention. And this has a really big impact on our performance in cognitive tasks. Um, and this can be described by the yerkes dodson law of arousal. So basically, if we look at performance in cognitive tasks as a function of norepinephrine activity, um, we find that with low levels of norepinephrine release in the brain, we are drowsy and inattentive. And then we're at more intermediate levels, uh, we reach optimal performance in cognitive tasks. And then when we have really high baseline levels of norepinephrine in the brain, that's when we become anxious and distractible, and performance in cognitive tasks decreases. And so while we know that there's a correlation between norepinephrine release and task performance, we still don't understand what exactly it's doing in the brain to, facil to facilitate performance in cognitive tasks. And this is very important because abnormal norepinephrine signaling is implicated in the etiology of stress and anxiety disorders, depression, schizophrenia, um, sleep disorders, and cognitive decline. And it's also been shown that there are long-lasting changes in norepinephrine activity after early life stress. So before we can understand how norepinephrine is involved in all of these disorders, we first need to see what it's doing in the healthy brain in this kind of task-engaged and optimal performance state. Um, sorry. Okay. So what we want to know is how does norepinephrine facilitate behavioral performance? And because we know that at high levels of norepinephrine, um, this results in an anxious behavior, and anxiety can be considered a form of um, uncertainty about the future and about your environment. We posited that anxiety is a function of uncertainty. So the more uncertain you are about an outcome, the more anxious you'll be about it. For example, let's say you have to take an exam and you haven't studied for it, then you're going to be more anxious about it because you're not sure how you're going to perform. Um, so second, we thought that surprise would then be negatively correlated with uncertainty. Um, so to use the same example, uh, let's say you take this test that you didn't study for, and you're not sure how you did, but then you got a perfect score. Then that's going to be really surprising, and you're going to change your behavior uh, and be more confident moving forward. Um, but then on the flip side, yeah, on the flip side, let's say you thought it was really easy and you got a perfect score, then you won't be surprised by this, and you will not change your behavior. Um, so with these assumptions in mind, we hypothesize that norepinephrine signals uncertainty and surprise, and that behavioral performance is shaped by having accurate measurements of uncertainty and surprise. So to look at this in the brain, um, we are going to look, focus on the locus ceruleus, which is the primary source of norepinephrine in the brain. Um, and it projects throughout the brain to release norepinephrine everywhere else. Um, and so we hypothesize that then this is capable of broadcasting these uncertainty and surprise signals uh, throughout the brain to mediate performance in cognitive tasks. And so to study this, we can use a mouse model to directly record and manipulate neurons in the locus ceruleus, and thus directly measure and manipulate norepinephrine release in the brain. Okay. So to be able to have some measures of uncertainty and surprise in a goal-directed behavior, we train mice in a go no go <laughs> task where at the go tone, they have to push a lever to receive a water reward, and at the no-go tone, they have to refrain from pushing to avoid an air puff punishment. So for example, let's say the mouse gets a no-go tone. This is a low frequency tone. And then we also alter the volume on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. So at softer volumes, these are high uncertainty trials. And at louder volumes, these are low uncertainty trials. Um, so let's say the mouse does not press at the no-go tone. Then this is a correct rejection, and these are unreinforced. If the mouse does press at a no-go tone, then um, 
this is a false alarm, and the mouse gets an air puff punishment to let it know that it made the wrong choice. So for go tones, these are high frequency tones, and um, we do the same thing where we vary the volume on trial by trial basis to change the uncertainty. And if the mouse doesn't press at a go tone, then this is um, a miss, and that's unreinforced. And if they do press at a go tone, then that's a hit, and they get a water reward. And these mice are water restricted, so this water reward is very motivating. And um, basically, the goal of the task then is to um, get these water rewards and avoid these air puff punishments. And then we can measure and manipulate norepinephrine and see how it relates to task performance. Okay. So to look at the effect of uncertainty and surprise on mouse performance, um, well, we'll start with uncertainty. Um, we can measure the probability of pressing in the lever um, and then plot it at different tone intensities, where again, soft means high uncertainty and loud means low uncertainty. And so on the left side, I'll be plotting the false alarm reactions and the hit or the hits on false arm trials, and on the right, I'll be plotting the hits. Um, and so you can see that performance on go trials scales with the degree of confidence. So um, the louder the tone, the more certain they are that it's a go tone and that they should press the lever, and that's up here. Um, and then if we then look at the effect of surprise, uh, so to look at this, we're gonna look at performance after a false alarm, which is the most surprising outcome. You can imagine that the mouse is pressing the lever, so they think that they're gonna get a water reward, but instead they get an air puff punishment. Um, so this is a surprise. Uh, so how does this change their behavior? And so we see that following a false alarm, mice perform fewer false alarms on the next trial and more hits. And um, that's kind of this effect of a surprising outcome. So. Next, we want to know what norepinephrine neurons are doing during the task. Um, so to do this, we used a mixture of optogenetics and electrophysiology um, to record neural activity. And so we use a genetic strategy to make any neurons fire when we shine a specific wavelength of light on them. And then we're recording at the same time so we can see which neurons are responsive to the light and then only take those recordings because we know those are the ones releasing norepinephrine in the brain. Um, so if we do this, then we can look at the activity of any neurons during the task. And here I'm going to show you rasters at the top. So each line will be a neuron here, each row. Um, and there's 27 neurons in the recording. And then the color will indicate the firing rate. And um, on the x-axis will be the time from press. And so we can see that in all norepinephrine units, there's a large increase in firing rate, which is this indicated by this red dashed line, um, following a punishment. And then if we plot the average activity of all the units, we find that there's a huge spike in any neural activity following a punishment. Um, okay, so we can also look at this for hits, and we see that neurons are also responsive pre-press and post-reward in this task. And then if we pull this out by tone intensity, we can see that, um, or uncertainty, we find that pre-press, any neurons are, um, they fire more when the tone is louder, so when there's less uncertainty, and fire less when the tone is softer, so when there's more uncertainty. And then if we do the same, look at the same relationship post-reward, we find that when a reward is more surprising, so after a softer tone, which again is high uncertainty, um, that's when any neurons fire the most. And so from these data, we can see that any neurons are signaling pre-press, um, Signaling uncertainty pre-press and surprise post-reinforcement. Okay. So uh, we next want to see if this any activity is actually what's driving the behavioral performance. To do that, we're going to use a similar genetic strategy to selectively silence any neurons with a different wavelength of light. And so we'll no longer be getting this increase in firing rate pre-press and post-reinforcement. And then we can test whether this is important for their behavioral performance. Um, so to look at the effect of any silencing on task execution, we can plot the probability of the lever press uh, by tone intensity again. And um, we find that uh, any signaling is only important for facilitating pressing on these high uncertainty trials. So the green dots are showing um, the difference in pressing when there is no norepinephrine. And you can see that it's below zero, so they're pressing less when we silence any. Um, okay. And then we can also look at the effect of any silencing on learning. And to do that, we're gonna look at um, the change in hit rate following a false alarm with and without norepinephrine. And as you'll remember, um, usually following a false alarm, there's an increase in hit rate on the next trial. But when we silence norepinephrine, we no longer see this increase in hit rate on the next trial. And so these data indicate that blocking norepinephrine impairs task execution under uncertain conditions and prevents learning from surprising outcomes. 
And so, altogether, these data um, show that norepinephrine signaling is signaling uncertainty and surprise in the brain, and that this encoding of uncertainty is important for task execution, particularly for low stimulus evidence, or when uncertainty is high. Um, and any signaling of surprise facilitates learning or improved performance on the next trial. And so this is how at intermediate levels of norepinephrine, um, we, it facilitates optimal performance in cognitive tasks. And you can see that the timing of any release is actually really important, not just whether or not it's there. Um, and so this suggests that abnormal LC activity observed after early life stress or other brain disorders can impair task execution and learning through inaccurate encoding of uncertainty and surprise. Okay. Um, and with that, I would like to thank Marganka for letting me join his lab and do this work and all of his mentorship, and also Vincent, who is a former postdoc in the lab, um, who I did all these experiments with, and also the rest of my lab and collaborators. <laughs>